Good morning, everyone. So good to see all of you this morning and your smiling faces, especially you, Trey, and you, David, and you, Whitney. <laughs> Stand up with us. Uh, it is our prayer and our hope this morning uh, that God will be lifted in this place. Uh, and so we're going to start with a song that says just that. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world. of something like this. Good morning, church. Many of you, like me, think of communion when you think of something like this, a shiny tray filled with cups or filled with pieces of cracker that, when I was growing up, were distributed amongst the worship assembly by men with coats and ties and a somber look on their face, and we took communion in a very quiet, respectful way. Recently, this experience for many of us has been replaced by this. Rather than shiny trays, a single serving packet of communion, or in our case at Hunter Hills, the two cups with the bread on the bottom and the juice on the top, not taken in a worship assembly, but many times taken in our living room as we watched a worship service online. For some of us, that's still our reality because they're unable to join us because of health issues, or other concerns. If we were in the first century church, our experience wouldn't look like either one of these. Our experience would look like a gathering around a table for an agape or a love feast where we shared and fellowshiped with one another. It's easy to be distracted by the 
form of communion and forget the function, the purpose, the spirit of communion. I believe that it's the most sacred thing that we do together as a body. I think that the, the New Testament is clear that the first century church gathered for the purpose of breaking bread with each other. And so I think it's important as we begin to regather that we have a conversation about the role of communion in our lives as a church. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about communion. I'm excited that Paul Evans is going to start that series today. And then Stephen and I are going to preach through several texts where we think about communion as a covenant where every week we talk about remembering, renewing our covenant relationship with God through the observance of communion. I hope that you'll make a point to join us, either in person or online, as we think more fully about what it's like to live into our identity as believers individually, but also how do we live into our identity as the church. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hunter Hills. It's, uh, it's a beautiful fall day to come and, uh, and, and worship, and it's really good to look out and see uh, this Sunday we all came together. Looks like a weekend everybody's home. I've seen some visitors home, and uh, really good to be together. Um, as Rusty said, we're starting off a, a series on communion. I'm excited about that. That's, uh, that's a subject that's near and dear to this church's heart and, uh, and, and to mine as well, and I hope it's something that y'all enjoy and and come back and, and hear, and, um, or if you can't be here, pick it up online, because it's something that um, we've been preparing for, and I know that y'all are going to uh, gain from. We, uh, as part of fall coming up, we've got uh, Trunk or Treat coming up next Sunday, and that's something, if you've not been to, if you're new to the church or just visiting here, uh, you're certainly welcome to attend, but we just come together uh, next Sunday afternoon here uh, in the church parking lot, and have a trunk or treat we'll have bobbin for apples and dress ups and food for the kids and for everybody and roast some wieners and build a fire it's a lot of fun and um anyway if you hadn't already planned to participate i hope you will it's uh it really is it really is a lot of fun and the kids love it and uh i love it too because i get to eat a hot dog lisa doesn't let me eat a lot of hot dogs <laughs> get to eat a grilled hot dog on that day um it's been a good it's been a bit a really good week for uh for Hunter Hills in a lot of ways and um we've had uh some young people get baptized um Troy and Cage Berkey got baptized if you know that family um congratulate them and uh also Joseph Morrow was baptized not during services but after time but it was a good celebratory time for their family and we rejoiced with them and and with the angels about that so good day to be here uh, join in worship with the praise team, and uh, let's uh, let's worship our God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole?
know, in the days of a lot of contemporary music, there are just some hymns that when you hear them, it's, it's tough. You know, just get chills. And that is one of them that when we sing, I get chills every time we sing it. So thank you for doing that today. Years ago, um, North Point Community Church put together a, a ministry program that they called From the Front Porch to the Kitchen. And it was an engagement type ministry uh, to, to draw families and people together. And, and they used the analogy of the, the house, you know, the, from the front porch. You know, the front porch is that place where you keep people at a distance, right? They come to your door and they, they're at the front porch. We don't let them in. Don't let them in. Just, just stand here on the porch. Well, then, you know, as you get to know them a little better, you'll invite them in and they come and maybe they'll, they'll be in the entryway there. You know, we don't want them to stand in the cold, but we sure don't want them all the way in the house because we don't know who these people are. And then from there, maybe you let them go to the living room as you get to know them better and better. But then when they just become part of who you are, where do they end up? It's in the kitchen. Because what's in the kitchen? The table. That's where the table is. So we just bring everybody in and we gather them up around the table. And I, I think it's no coincidence that when Jesus established the, the Lord's Supper that they did it around a table. And so the table is very intimate. It's an intimate setting. And at Hunter Hills, we, we use that image, imagery quite a bit, the, the imagery of the table and how important the table is. And it's the, it's the time where we share good news and we're excited with each other, but it's also time when we have to do things that are, that are hard sometimes. I can, we had a few conversations around our table with our kids that were great. And there were a few times when somebody left crying um, just because that's just where you did it was at the table. So today we gather at the table. We're together. The Hunter Hills family is together at the table. And everyone is welcome. And we're glad to have you here. But today we get to welcome a family to our table officially. So I want to invite Terry and Cindy Williams to come forward. And uh, if, I'd like to invite all the shepherds to come up here as well. If y'all come up here to the front, we're going to stand up here a couple times here today. This is Williams. They come to us from the Lamb. No, y'all have to stand on the podium. Y'all get up here. We'll stand up here with you. Yeah, they'll stand up there with you. <laughs> yeah, you're not that short. That's right. Terry and Cindy come to us from the Landmark Church. Uh, Terry uh, works for International Paper, where he has been there for uh, a little over 40 years. Cindy is a retired nurse, and they have, to get, they have been married for 46 years. There was a little discussion about that earlier. They had a difference of opinion about that. Uh, but 46 was the number that we came to. Yeah, 44 is great years. 44 good years, a couple of rough ones in there. So uh, <laughs> he only counts the good ones. Well, Cindy said it was 33. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I was just to tell you that. I, she did that while you walked off. Um, Together they have four children, 15 grandchildren, and they were, he was telling me today that um, six of those grandchildren were adopted through Agape that we learned about last week, so that is really, really cool. So we're excited to have Terry and Cindy as a part of this family. I told them earlier today, you're not official at Hunter Hills until you get clapped for. So let's welcome Terry and Cindy. And... Um, Vernon is going to pray a prayer blessing over them. Let's pray. Father, today um, we're so thankful um, that you, uh, you refresh us and you bring families our way. And we thank you for, for Terry and Cindy. We know that uh, you have purpose in that to bring them here so that we can um, be a blessing to them and them to us. And Father, we, we again, we, we just thank you. I pray a special blessing on Terry and Cindy that you would... Bless their lives uh, in you and while they're here with us. And, um, and Father, we just thank you again for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so that's the good news. That's the good news we get to share around the table. Now we have to share the bad news. And that is that this is the last Sunday that Eric and Tiffany McKinnon are going to be with us. They are uh, leaving here and going 
to the D.C. area for their next assignment as part of the United States Air Force. So uh, I want to invite Eric and Tiffany and um, Verity and you don't have to go very far, Tiffany, you're right there. Verity and Titus, they came to us uh, four years ago. I was reminded last night that uh, Titus was 16 months old when they came here. They were McKinnon party of three. When they arrive, they will leave here McKinnon party of four. Titus is going to go right on to the front. Um, this is a good family. I love them dearly. I'm turning into Bob Stacy. That's just driving me crazy. <laughs> they have been a part of our small group uh, since they've been here. And they're the kind of families we love to have at Hunter Hills because when they came here, they didn't come to sit in a chair. They came to serve and to minister. And they've done that the entire time that they have been here. And I still remember the first time they walked in those doors back there in the back. I never dreamed that they would become so close to our family. And um, they've been a really big part of this church family. And they're going to leave a hole. There's going to be some empty chairs around the table. But we do pray God's blessings on y'all. Um, we tried to pray that you wouldn't have to leave, and that didn't work. So we're going to pray harder that you get to come back. We're going to pray that they get to come back, that the military sends them here again for a second tour of duty. But um, we wish y'all well. Um, we wish you much happiness, much joy. Don't, don't, forget, don't forget the family here who loves you dearly. And as we like to say, there will always be a place at our table for you whenever you're ready to come back. So let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, they made a lot of friends when they were here. I mean, I, tell you, I, I could almost say just go stand in the middle right there. But I would like to invite uh, their small group and anybody that would like to come and stand uh, with them. I know they've got really, really close Really, really close friends here. So just come right on up here and we'll stand around them. And This is family. You're getting a picture of it right now. This is family. This is what it's all about. So let's, uh, let's all symbolically put our hands on their shoulders right now and, and let's pray a prayer blessing. Our Father, we thank you. We prayed earlier. We pray that you refresh us for refreshing us with people who come uh, to this place. And Lord, today we thank you that um, a few years ago you sent us Eric and Tiffany and Titus. And then Verity joined us. And Father, we thank you for bringing them here. We thank you for allowing us to love them. And thank you that they loved us as well. And Lord, as they leave Prattville and as they head up to the, to the D.C. area, Lord, I just pray that you will, you will be with them. Lord, I pray that you will open up a door of opportunity at a church up there where they can serve as they have served here. They can love as they've loved here. And that they will be loved as they've been loved here. So, Father, take care of them. And I always remind them of uh, the joy that they had while they were here and to be reminded that there will always be a place uh, at our table. So, Lord, take care of them, look after them, and we thank you for them. And it's through Jesus we all pray together. Amen. We, we don't we don't. So as Rusty reminded, I'm going to ask the guys, if y'all go ahead and pass the, go ahead and pass the trays. And remember today as you grab it, to be sure you grab both cups. The bread's on the bottom, the juice is on the top. So y'all come on and do that now. As Rusty reminded us, the table is why we come together. Um, it's, it's probably the most important thing that we do. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's just so appropriate that Jesus 
when he instituted the, the, the Lord's Supper, they were reclining around a table together. They were in this intimate setting. And he told them, he told them when they, he told them when they got it, this is the bread. The bread's going to remind you of my body that was broken. This is the juice that's going to remind you of my blood that would be shed. And as often as you do it, remember, remember me, remember me, and you'll proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so today, as a church family, as one, we sit around that table, the table that welcomes the Williams family. It's also the table that uh, sends the McKinnons to another place, another duty station. But it's a table where we're all one. We're all part of God's family. And that gives us joy. So today, as you eat that bread, as you drink that cup, remember. Remember Jesus. Remember what he did for you and what he continues to do. And when you drink that juice, you remember that blood that continually washes you every single day. So let's pray together. Father, today is a, is a good day. Anytime we can be together with our family, we give you thanks. We thank you for loving us. And we thank you most of all that you demonstrated that love when you gave us Jesus. And uh, for what he did on the cross that gives us all hope, we, we say thank you. Father, we also thank you for this reminder that we hold in our hands. This bread that reminds us that his body was, was beaten and bruised and broken, hung on a cross. And for this juice that reminds us that his blood continually washes us every single day. It washes us from those, those bad choices that we make, the decisions that we make that, don't, that do not honor you. So Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, may we always be reminded as we take it what you did for us. And may we all proclaim uh, the Lord's death until we're all together with you. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to Why?
this time, as we typically do, we're going to dismiss our little ones to a very special time of worship for them. So this is going to be kids ages three up through kindergarten. Uh, there will be folks back there to lead them in that time of worship. If you've got a little one uh, in that age range, you'll go out these doors and to the right, and someone will be there to greet you. All right, good morning. Y'all better pull that down a little bit. I'm not even warmed up yet. All right, so great to be with you guys because I always love your energy. I love your heart. I love seeing the scene that we saw around the table this morning, uh, sending and receiving. I've known the Williams, I don't know, maybe 25 years. You are going to love having Terry and Cindy here because they are servants. It's going to be a blast for you guys. I love seeing Keith get choked up a little bit. Mention Bob gets choked up. It's a rumor. It's a rumor that my boy Stephen might get choked up. <laughs> so I feel a little obligated to share a tear this morning. I'm going to try to do it. Now, Stephen gets it honest. Gets it honest. I was mentioning this Wednesday night when I was teaching class here. Uh, my grandfather was incredibly sensitive. And if, if it came to the word of God, he absolutely would get emotional. It, and, and I can get that way as well because it's so overwhelming. It's so amazing what God was willing to do. And so I only saw my grandfather through that lens, through that light. Every time that I saw my grandfather, I knew that if the word came up, he was going to be especially sensitive. So years after he passed away, a, a gentleman came up. He was probably about six foot four, six foot five, weighed about 285, just a giant of a man, at that time fairly elderly. He said, you know, your granddaddy, was my principal in the 1940s. He said, man, I just miss that man. He was such a disciplinarian. I said, my granddaddy, disciplinarian. He said, yeah, I remember getting in trouble one day, and you could hear his wingtip shoes slapping the wood floors coming down the hallway, and everybody got completely silent because we didn't know who was in trouble. And he often didn't even call your name. He would just step to the door of the classroom. He would point, and he'd say, now, my granddaddy is maybe a little bit shorter than me. I'm like 5.5.5 on a good day. Daddy B is probably right around 5'4", weighed about 130 pounds, and this giant man is talking about my granddaddy being a disciplinarian. I said, well, what did he do? He said, well, he'd call me out, and then he'd reach up and he'd grab my earlobe, and he'd pull it down to his belt, and he would lead me to the office. And I thought, man, that would not happen today. They'd be screaming, there'd be a fight, parents would be calling the office. Back in that day, Mickey was more scared of his dad finding out than my granddaddy. But I thought, wow, what a different image and a different view to be able to see. So when it comes to the Word of God and to know that on one side we can be extremely sensitive and on the other side we can be extremely strong in our life. And I think that we see that a lot in the life of Christ. There were times where he was extremely sensitive to the moment and times in which he was extremely strong in the moment. I think we're going to see both of those today. If you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. be a familiar passage. But as we begin this series on the covenant and communion, this is really focusing on the beginning aspects, the, the catalyst of what made communion critical and necessary and why we still need it today. And so the passage says this beginning in verse 23. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is now as the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're going to have five points pretty quick today. And if you're taking notes, it begins with this. This took place at the right moment. It took place in the right moment. Notice that it says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed. On the night that he was betrayed is when he came and brought this gift to us, this communion to us. On the night in which he was betrayed by Judas. On the night in which he was denied by Peter. On the night in which everybody scattered. I want to bring you something so you do not forget. Honestly, I don't get this. I'm not the same gift giver when it comes to betrayal. I mean, if betrayed today, I might want to give a last supper, like the very last supper, instead of I'm bringing a supper that's going to last forever. Remember me when you do this every single time that you take this bread and you drink this cup. Remember what I have given. Remember what took place. Remember that even on the night that he was betrayed, he washed feet. So instead of judging, instead of being harsh, instead of being rude, he's bringing a gift, a gift in the right moment. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Literally, while we were in the middle of sin, while we were committing the act, that's the moment that he died. I think all of us in our life, when we reflect at times, we go, Man, I I tell you what, God can forgive a lot, but I'm not sure he can forgive that. Your darkest moment, the moment that you want to forget, the moment that you hope will never come up again, that's the moment that he said, you're so worthy, I'm dying for you in this moment. Not in your best moment, in your worst moment, in your darkest moment. That's the moment that I'm dying. And it was almost in the apostle's worst moment, on the night that he was betrayed. He says, I want to give you something so that you always remember. Not remember your betrayal. Remember my rescue. Remember my redemption. So how could he even do this? So the first point was the right moment. Number two is the right motive. The right motive. How does he do this when he's been betrayed? Jesus, as a rabbi, had a lens. Every rabbi back then had a lens, and you found out what the lens was by asking a simple question. And the question was, what are the greatest commands? So every time I saw that in scripture, I thought the guys were just asking him, maybe it's, a, it's to judge him, maybe it's to figure out if he knows the word. They're asking him, what is your lens? Because everybody didn't have the same lens. Every rabbi had the first command identical. Every rabbi believed Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the rabbis could vary on the second command. In fact, one rabbinical school taught that the second command is keep the Sabbath. That was number two. Now, love your neighbor was still in there, but it was like number six. Jesus says, loving God, loving people, those are the two greatest commands. And because that is his lens, everything flowed through that. So how in the world does he bring this gift in the middle of being betrayed? He's able to do it because that's who he is and what he focuses on. Loving God, loving people. How's he going to love these betrayers? He's going to love them by giving them a symbol of his greatest gift ever. His death, his burial, his resurrection. In Matthew 5, it says this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. He's saying if you're coming to love God, if you're coming to bring this gift, 
but your brother has something against you. Not even you got something against your brother. You just remember, oh man, I'm not getting along with so-and-so. We've had a tip, we've had an out. Uh, I'm just kind of pushing it on them to, to make the call and restore this. He says, uh-uh, uh-uh, if you're gonna love God, you're gonna reconcile first. You're gonna love people first before you bring your gift. And Jesus is doing the same thing. Before I give you this gift, I'm giving it to you in the middle of betrayal to let you know that you are accepted, that things are right. And he's ultimately talking about forgiveness because forgiveness is the ultimate catalyst for communion. Over in Matthew 6, it says this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive our, sin, our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive those men when, uh, when they are against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. We're so used to this. This is a normal passage for us. And even this, this Lord's Prayer we're thinking, man, this is, this is such an incredible prayer that Jesus gave. You remember the disciples only asked one time for God to teach them anything, for Jesus to teach them anything. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. So I always thought, man, Jesus comes up with this ultimate type prayer that we've quoted for the last 2,000 years. Then I found out there's a reason. It's not only called the Lord's Prayer, it's also called the common prayer. It's called the common prayer because it had been around for thousands of years. It wasn't a new prayer. Jesus says the prayer that you say every day at lunch, that's the prayer that you are supposed to pray. There's only one piece of this prayer that is not found anywhere throughout the previous centuries. And the one piece of the prayer that's changed, the one piece of the prayer that Jesus adds is forgiveness. It's brand new. They'd not heard it before because they only believed that God could forgive. They did not believe that it was their role to forgive at all. That if you sinned against me, it was simply your job to ask God for forgiveness. I've got zero responsibility to you. It's just between you and God. Yeah, you wronged me, but it's between you and God. I don't have anything to do with it. Now Jesus is turning the tables and saying it's not just between them and God. It's about you and them. It's about them coming to you and asking for that forgiveness. Now that, that seems common to us because it's what we do today. It was very uncommon back then. They probably thought this was some crazy blasphemous teaching. Because think about the number of times that Jesus said your sins are forgiven. And somebody said, one of the teachers of the law said, who is this? For only God can forgive sins. And yeah, God only can forgive sins, but we certainly have the responsibility to forgive each other. And every time that we're at the table, it's a reminder, you have been forgiven and you are called to forgive. So it's an interesting scene, Jesus' lens of saying, love God, love people. How is that done? By accepting and by giving forgiveness. So there's the right moment, there's the right motive. Number three, there's the right method. The right method. I mean, he used such common emblems, the bread and the wine, something that was part of their everyday lives. They didn't actually have to leave the house too much to get it. It was kind of like going to get groceries for us. It would be something super common in our pantries. It was part of sustaining their day-to-day -day life, and it's almost as if Jesus is saying, I'm going to use something that you can't escape. I'm going to make sure you remember me, not just when you take this together in this unified setting, but that you're going to see it throughout the week. And in that culture, you're going to see it every single day. He said, this, this bread is my body, given for you, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And the cup, he took it and he blessed it. He said, every time you take this cup, he said, whenever you drink it, whenever you drink it, do it on purpose, intentionally, to remember me. I love our practice. 
especially in our fellowship, of taking it every single week. I've, I've been blessed to travel the world with a lot of mission organizations, and everywhere we go, on every Sunday, we're always taking communion. We're always unified around those symbols, those emblems, to remind us that while our lives could be crazy divergent, economically, socially, lifestyle-wise, this unifies us. Unifies us under the umbrella of being forgiven. Unifies us under the same call. Unifies us under the same cause. That we are no longer different when we come together with the same need. I mean, you even think about Christ on the cross where one of the thieves said, hey, if you're really the, the Christ, save yourself and us. And I always picture the other guy on the other side of the cross kind of leaning out and looking over across Jesus to the other end going, who are you to say anything seeing that you're in the same boat? You're in the same situation. The truth is, if you're nailed to the cross, you don't actually get the right to say anything about anybody else. The cross is not a great place of judgment. And we're all sinners. And the cup reminds us that we've all been set free. So when we look around the room and we're worshiping together, it's not that someone's more holy than someone else or more right than someone else. We've all been rescued the same. So it's the perfect method that we get to partake of to remind us that we're unified because of the cross of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, all receiving the same gift, all participating in the same memorial, and all saved by the same God. The right moment, the right motive, right method, and it's the right mission. When he said, do this in remembrance, do this to remember, I want to jog your memory, he's saying. I want these to be so locked in that you can't escape what this message is. Now, for us, it's very common, but if you get out there in the world and you start explaining communion to somebody, it sounds sounds kind of weird. And it really has through the centuries if you've done any study on that, right? So let me get this right. You're eating somebody's flesh and you're drinking somebody's blood. I mean, it does. It sounds odd. But then when you look at the symbolism of bread and you look at the symbolism of wine, it makes complete sense and it's something that we get to share because this mission that we have together to take the forgiveness that we've received and to put it towards somebody else. Not simply saying, hey, I'm calling you to understand the Bible completely or I'm calling you to have this knowledge completely. What we're calling is to say, hey, you've got a problem that you cannot save yourself from and we want to invite you to the solution. One of the biggest challenges in our world today and especially in America is just when we get overwhelmed with debt. Uh, Some of us probably in this room have so much debt, you're already thinking about next month and thinking, how in the world are we going to X? How are we going to make the mortgage payment? How are we going to make that credit card payment? Some of you probably had student loans for decades. How are we going to make the student loan payment? Debt can be so overwhelming. And then even when, not to get off politically, but you look at the government, they're trying to do, what, another $3 trillion of debt. Most of us don't go, oh, man, debt's good. We're like, man, it's oppressive. It pushes us down. It squeezes us. It's stressful. And so spiritually, we had this debt, this overwhelming debt that we could not pay for, that we didn't have enough payments. It didn't matter if the payment book was this thick. We could not get away from the debt of sin. And Jesus steps in and says, how about I just write it all off? How about I take care of every ounce of it? And not over time. It's not a payment plan. How about I wipe your slate clean immediately? No waiting. No worry. No more stress. No more doubt. All of the pain of sin taken away. And so that's our mission is to share this idea and concept of forgiveness in a way that is freeing and that is redeeming. And then finally, there's the right moment, the right motive, Right method, right mission, and it's the right message. The right message. He says, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Keep talking about it. Keep sharing it. Keep proclaiming it. Hebrews 9.22 says, unless there's the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Share about the forgiveness that has come so that every week we come and celebrate it through this communion. We've been forgiven. We've been forgiven. We've been forgiven so that we can forgive those that need forgiveness as well, especially within our own body that maybe we struggle with. 
A few years ago, I was in India, and we're on the rooftop of a city in North India, and it is extremely unfriendly to Christians. South India, very Christian-oriented. North India, very dangerous. I think a few weeks before we arrived in North India, they had trapped uh, a couple of hundred believers in a church. Uh, the locals had. They put chains around the doors. They lit it on fire, burnt them alive inside the building. So this is the territory that we're going into. So we get into town, and, and it's not just a gigantic town uh, for India. I think that we were on the, maybe the sixth floor of a building. We are on the rooftop, because you usually had your meetings on the rooftop, hoping to catch a breeze, because nothing was air-conditioned. So we're on the top of the roof in the city, and it's the highest building in the city of Hermichael Pradesh. And Saji, our missionary, is setting up all the sound equipment. And he takes the speakers at the four corners of the roof, and he turns them out toward the city. And I said, um, Saji, 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 Saji. He said, Brother Paul, today, the city of Hermaiko Padesh, we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, Saji, Saji, I don't know if you know, uh, a few weeks ago, they burnt like a whole church down with everybody in it. Uh, I don't think that this is like the best idea. It's not a wise idea. It's a dangerous idea, Saji. Yes, Brother Paul. It is a very good day, a very good day to die for the Lord. Saj, I don't have, I don't have that on my calendar. <laughs> God. I don't think this is my day. <laughs> he proclaimed it without shame. This message that he so believed in, the forgiveness that comes only through Jesus Christ, that he could not stay quiet. I'd love to stand before you today and say I had so much faith. I was just out there shouting from the rooftops. I was, I was watching. I was watching for the crowds to come and get us. Lord blessed us. Everything went extremely well. Some even came to Christ that day because of their boldness. What about our boldness? We live in America. We live in a situation where we're so afraid of getting offended or canceled that we won't say anything. We're barely bold about going to church. And this is a message that's worthy. It's a message of worthy to be shared because it's a message that is completely transformed our lives. And if it has, we talk about it. He gave it at the right moment when he was betrayed. He gave it because of the right motive, because he loved God and loved people. He used the right method, bread and wine. He had the right mission, do this in remembrance. He had the right message. Keep proclaim it, proclaim it, proclaim it. Until when? When do we stop? When he comes back. My grandfather on my biological father's side uh, was holiness, uh, and he, he was vocal. But I remember spending the night with him one night, and he was walking around his house about 2 in the morning, hands up, just circling the house, shouting at the top of his lungs in the neighborhood, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Scared me to death. I was a kid. I was like, hold on, I'm not ready just yet. But his boldness, we keep proclaiming the message. And every week, we take a bread, we take a cup, and we remember. We remember that we have been forgiven. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you for the power of Jesus Christ. We praise you for his death, his burial, his resurrection. We praise you that we have been made completely new because of him. Father, give us boldness to live out the power of these symbols. Give us boldness to proclaim the death, the burial, and resurrection. Give us the boldness to remember that we have been forgiven, not to walk away unconfident or insecure spiritually, but to know that you have paid the price. Pray this together in the name of Jesus, we say, amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night. 
I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. What a good day to be in the house of God. It's uh, just fun to celebrate. Paul, thank you for that message. Um, one we can all leave here with the day um, proclaiming. We're uh, when everybody, everybody's invited and we're forgiven. Always said it's the, it's the news that just seems too good to be true. But it is true and it's what we live by and what we claim. So thank you for reminding us of that today um one thing i forgot to mention earlier um jerry hall's mama fell this weekend and broke her hip that's a scary thing for for anybody but uh got word today that she uh, had surgery this morning and went really well and um she's she's healing up so um thank god uh for taking care of jerry's mom sybil Let's, uh, let's end with a prayer. Father, thank you for how you love us. And thank you, Father, for each other. Thank you for this church uh, that we can come together and be, be refreshed and be strengthened and be reminded of how uh, wonderful you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.